Dark Moon Books presents a selection of author readings from the anthology Horror Library, Volume 8. An Extract of Clay by Colin Leonard The school seemed smaller without the older children there. Adele Kerrigan, the school secretary, had managed to get through so much uninterrupted work on this day of the winter excursion to Sleeve Namarov. Only the two youngest classes had stayed behind, for fear their little legs wouldn't cope with the steep climb up the ancient local landmark. Or the poor things might get blown right off that hill, their teacher Miss Burke had joked to Adele earlier. It's fierce windy up there. Sleeve Namarv, translated from Irish as the Mountain of the Dead, was a bitter old climb, even if it was more of a great hill than a mountain. Adele had gone up with them a few years ago, in 1974, the year after they'd started the last round of excavations, and that had been enough for her. She wondered why the headmaster insisted every year on getting the school bus to wind up those terrible roads and deposit the children at its base for a miserable march to the top. Yes, it was in the history books, the actual ones on the curriculum, but it only had one line written about it not like the greater sites over on the other side of the county. Anyway, surely a Catholic school shouldn't be eulogising an old pagan burial site. Even if she didn't bother going to church every weekend, now that she was in her twenties, a constant cause of strife with her mother, she still thought it odd. What was the obsession with an old pile of stones? Headmaster Timmins would sometimes fizzle as if he were about to pop when he talked about the place. Adele dipped into her handbag for a toffee, unwrapped it beneath her desk and popped it into her mouth. They'd be back shortly, and the uncommon piece would be broken again. She shouldn't be eating the sweets. They played havoc with her skin. She thought she'd heard some of the older, hard-faced kids call her a name behind her back recently. She thought they called her Spotty. An extract of Ma Zhu, Goddess of the Sea, by Ai Jiang. You call my body at 1 a.m., and naturally, I answer. Though my wife complains that I sleep through most of daylight, having spent late nights with you, parting only after we watch the sunrise together, she would much prefer it to me lying next to her, dreaming a dream much different than the one she has both while asleep and awake. Today is my day off. Rather than the large Moto Ram boat I share with other fishermen during the week to provide for Fudo seafood markets, I head for the rowboat instead, the one I purchased with the spare change I saved up for you, the one I hid am still hiding from my wife. She thinks I work seven days a week, but on Sundays, I reserve those past midnight hours for you. I unfastened the rope securing the boat to the dock with shaky, excited fingers. I envy that our boat receives your caress first, the way it remains buoyant, as though mocking my incompetency, the fragility of my mortality and my perishable human body. But you never fail to make me feel the shiver that raises the hairs on my legs as I tread into you, pushing the gen boat gently into your waves. I sigh low when I leave you, drawing my legs into the wooden divider between us. But it calms me when I lower my oar, feeling your resistance, feeling your welcome against its painted body, the vibration against my palms. Farther and farther into your core I push until I can barely see the dock, my home sitting in the distance, until I am almost lost, but not quite, but completely, utterly surrounded by you and the scent of salt and fish so different from my wife's chemical rose shampoo, a scent so much more alluring. An extract of Story of Her Life by Tom Johnstone. It was only as evening wore on that she noticed some of the women there wore masks. She recognised all the faces in the room as belonging to their wearers. Then, as she looked closer, she saw how immobile some of them were, thin lines delineating the point where mask met face, eyes not quite fitting the fixed expressions. The wearers 
seem to stare in horror from faces with painted on smiles, as if their eyes were silently screaming through the eye holes. Was this a masked ball where people wore versions of their own faces over their real ones, but only some of them, eight women in total? Later, he would explain that all the masked women appeared in his books, but she was different, special. This is the first time I've ever fallen in love with one of my characters, he said with one of his most ingratiatingly wolfish grins. She thought he meant her, and succumbed to his charms, her misgivings about his intentions melting away in his embrace. At the launch party for the second book, he gave her a mask of her own face. Instinctively she touched it, then drew her fingers away, flinching at something repellent about the texture of the material. It smelled funny too, so much so she longed to remove it, but he insisted she keep it on throughout the party. Over time he grew tired of her and sought diversion with someone else. She soon guessed who this someone was, someone she knew almost as well as she knew herself. He'd abandoned her for her fictional counterpart, her shadow woman. She wondered if this was the woman he'd desired all along. When they argued about it, he tried to use her own words against her. She told him to stop putting words into her mouth. He just smiled a sad little smile and said, Come now, my love. That's what I've been doing ever since we first met. Only the Stones Will Hear You Scream by R.A. Busby It was a tight squeeze. That was all. In a moment, Pete would work his hand free, and like Superman flying below the breathing earth, he would stretch until his fingers found a way through the crack in the rock. Ahead lay a larger cave chamber where he could turn around and head back to the light. There had to be. Kevin had explained it all to him the night before. Here it is. They call this passage Daddy's Home. They'd been in Kevin's Jeep in the warm Nevada dusk, neither willing to go inside yet. Pete had taken the phone, keenly aware of Kevin's fingers, and stared at the cave map, unsure what he was seeing. It looked like a bird's claw with bends and tubes branching from a central tunnel. Like an ant farm, Pete murmured, I thought caves were, well, chambers with stalactites. Hating how foolish he sounded, he added, sorry, not many geology classes for, for business. For a moment, he had forgotten his own major. Over dinner, Kevin's dad had casually asked about Pete's plans after graduation, that adult variation on what do you want to be when you grow up? And Pete had been stuck again. It was unsettling. Kevin gave an easy laugh. <laughs> well, some caves really are big chambers, stalactites included. Others look like, what'd you say, ant farms? He nodded. That's perfect, Pete. Ever thought about majoring in English? Pete shot him a sharp glance, but Kevin's eyes held only interest and kindness. No, my dad would never... Pete shook his head, unsure if he should continue. Then he did. When I was applying to colleges before dad got cancer... He told me I'd be majoring in business or food stamps. An extract of Hymns in the Dark by Gordon Grease. The trees reached out to brush them, or so it seemed, for Mathers couldn't keep the horse centered in the road with so little to see. Abruptly, the lantern cast its green light on the oak that marked their turn toward church. There, lined up along a branch, a dozen birds were perched with their beaks tucked in. Rock doves, finches, even one of their own speckled hens, and among the rest, a bald eagle. It was tall as a five-year-old child. Mathers saw the lumped muscles under its feathers. He just about wanted to touch them. A transparent white eyelid blinked across its eye as the light fell on its face. Sarah tightened her hold on his waist and began to pray. Mathers wanted to chastise her for being afraid. Instead, he joined in. The eagle adjusted its footing. Its eyes rolled beneath their tender lids. 
Mathers urged the horse on, though it seemed inclined to drowse like the birds. Further down the road, a yellow light blazed up, like a single eye opening in a dark face. An Extract of Solace by Anna Ziegelhoff Solace, Vermont, they said. Yes, I understand that, I said. On the side. Yes, on the side. I traveled to the interview. I learned that on site meant on site. I arrived at a modern building held in glass, concrete, pine, and bamboo in a large and serene forest. I was interviewed by Kali. I was going to be in charge of computer systems, Kali told me. Projectors and interactive whiteboards, the intranet. Computerized aspects of building management, such as badge access control. All of the doors and gates, essentially. All of the surveillance and fences. All of the generators and servers. Kali showed me the apartment that came with the job, the bamboo and glass and concrete penthouse on top of the main building with a view of Vermont autumn leaves. It was spacious, furnished comfortably, neutrally contemporary. Stunning, I said. Kali agreed. I asked some questions about life there, the isolation deep in the forest. Kali answered truthfully. Not always easy, but generous in terms of paid time off, beautiful landscape, delicious free food, recreational facilities available 24-7. I was offered the job, and I accepted it. I moved into a sprawling penthouse I would never have been able to afford anywhere else. I found the list of rules on the bamboo desk, honey golden, in the late afternoon sun of my arrival day. No running. Do not acknowledge persons in the hallways. If acknowledged, walk. No running. Do not look behind you. Do not try to escape. Breathe calmly. An extract of Poor Mad Isaac by Don Raymond. The old men hate the sea. They hate the way only those who once loved can hate. The way a junkie hates the needle. The way a priest hates God. They hate the sea when the sky is blue and they hate the sea when the sky is gray. But most of all, they hate the sea when it grows flat and chill and choked with seaweed drifting like drowned men's arm. Once, twice a year, the sea grows still and the fog grows thick. It noses in among the wharves and jetties and creeps down the dark and narrow cobbled streets whose lamps become dim galaxies. Then, Color Gullman puts down his pint of ale and cocks his head toward the window. Sure getting foggy out there, he murmurs. And they all agree with the old drunk that, yes, indeed, foggy it is. And soon enough, he finds a reason to be heading home, though every other night, they have to turn him out with the lights. And Ephraim Porter looks up from his maps and his phylacteries, and he, too, sees the fog, closes his eyes and listens. He nods and bids, bids his big orange tabby wellerman a somber goodbye. And in the shuttered house on Wicker Street, poor Matt Isaac blinks away the sweat-soaked sleep terror from his eyes, and at last... His memory turns away from the day he cut the ropes and saw the terror and betrayal blossom in his son's blue eyes. So the sea filmed them over and his head slipped beneath the waves. The boat made it back, storm-racked and half-broken. But part of Isaac stayed behind. An Extract of Zipper Back by Teresa Matsura Crocozilla wasn't particularly original. He just mimicked the Apocal Godzilla, except for a longer snout and more prominent fangs. But he'd spent days getting the details of that sneer right. The first thing one notices about the drawing are the generous number of arms and legs protruding limp and bloody from the saw-like fence of a mouth. Then one sees the red-soaked torsos there's his math teacher, Mr. Sneed, prominent unibrow, carefully cross-hatched, black X's for eyes indicating death. Doug from homeroom, the jerk who put gum in his hair and spit in his book bag, is another victim. Doug is being devoured, top half first. The kaiju's molars have flattened him, and he's only identifiable by his greasy jeans and heel-smashed converses. But the masterpiece corpse is his mother's newest boyfriend, Teddy, speared on a splendidly jutting canine, 
The pain is agonizing. He's still screaming, eyes bulging, an empty beer can gripped until half crushed in one hand. He's even pissed his pants. A giggle bubbles in his chest at the memory of it, the sense of control he had. But right now he works on his newest monster. It's his favorite by far. He calls it Scorpidome. Sleek, black, armored skin. It stands on its bottom legs. Two enormous pinchers high overhead. One of which is in the act of snapping a different version of Teddy in half. His favorite part of the drawing, though, is the segmented tail with its stinger curled up behind, a glistening drop of venom hanging from the tip, ready to strike at any moment. Oh, how he loves Scorpidon. Extract of Under the Pale Mother Moon by Garrick Cook Dower had not expected to make it back alive, and now that he had, he did not know what to do. Death had followed him home, and Dower stood before the bay window, waiting. He'd gone for a walk on the muddy game trail overlooking the bayou, a place he thought he knew well. The morning was swathed in a steaming mist as if the damp earth dreamed of some distant, more tropical place, and he couldn't see ten feet in any direction. He had the sense of walking alone in his own world, but he was not alone. He found the print pressed into the muddy floor of the trail, clear and fresh with tiny puddles in the bottom of the pug marks. He knelt in the muck and covered it with his hand and found that his splayed fingers would not quite span its length or breadth. He stood up and looked about himself, suddenly aware that the mist might hide many things. You're a big one, aren't you? He said softly. An extract of Holler Bridge by J. L. Hoy. His incomprehensible barking was just one more of an endless series of unknowable things. We're isolated even at birth, I thought. That moment as close as we are ever going to feel to anyone and even then unknowable, unknown. Whether we shout, write, whisper, or make love, fight or bark for that matter we do it alone our skulls like a prison an empty shell where an invisible ocean roars and is never heard we speak only to ourselves and whatever we know say or love dies with us the wind was relentless carrying a sudden chill and the threat of winter i remember putting my hand on one of the steel cables for support and climbing up onto the handrail the wind howled around me as I craned my neck and looked up at the unchanging, empty sky. It wheeled above me, and I felt myself swaying, dancing with the wind, which seemed to echo in some void in my head. The forest floor spun and dropped below. Maudie's barking grew distant, just another pointless noise. Barking and shouting, Paula shouting, shouting something I didn't bother to understand. Was this where she had stood, the nameless girl? The girl who had everything sorted and figured out and still fell away. I don't remember what came next. An Extract of Blockchain by Dexter McLeod As if on cue, the next video in the laptop's playlist began. The pale man was more agitated than before. He yelled at the camera. When the midwife started taking me apart inside, I learned what no one admits. I learned it that night, when I ran headlong into the unevolved reptilian part of my mind. Everyone eventually surrenders to the seat of primal emotion, the limbic region. I have it, and you do too. It's humanity's worst secret. Sure, we've made the internet, and the combustion engine, and landed on the moon. But fear makes fools of us all. Despite the trappings of our civilization, we find it's all a contrivance. A freshly severed head that doesn't understand it's only got a few seconds of consciousness left. Down deep, we're all animals, driven only by instinct and stimulus. Well, until you cross the line where the last drop of adrenaline finally burns off and the panic isn't enough to keep you moving. No one tells you that there's a third choice 
somewhere between fight or flight, but there is. It's called submission. And the midwife, she shows you. I submitted to her last night. I did. And the midwife took my hands. The man raised his arms into frame for the first time, and he cackled into the camera, seemingly proud to display the bandaged remnants of his freshly amputated forearms. I submitted. I did. I submitted to her. And in the end, you will too. The Horror Library, available anywhere fine books are sold.